So far we talked about correlation, dependence, and causation, and showed that these are all different things. But in the real life we want to actually infer some correlation or causation from data. So this is a video about how to do that. So what do we do in statistical inference? Uh, we start from a sample and then we draw conclusions about the probabilities of events or the mean or the variance that underlie the sample. Statistical inferences can not, never be 100% certain. There is always a possibility that the sample that we got is atypical and therefore the inference that we got is wrong. That probability, that probability that the inference is wrong, is called the p-value or the confidence level of the statement. And uh, it basically represents the possibility that what we see is just generated by random noise. So let's think about a simple example. We have some fertilizer producer and they want to prove that using their fertilizer significantly increases the yield of apple trees. And let's say that yield is the weight of the fruit generated per tree. Suppose we know that the mean is 100 pounds and the standard deviation is 10 pounds for the yield of untreated apple trees. So that's suppose that this is information that we already know from all of the previous um, trees that uh, we measured. We select 400 trees at random and treat them with fertilizer. We compute the average and average yield of the treated trees. And if this uh, um, yield is larger than 100, that shows that the fertilizer helps. But how large should this increase be for us to be sure, or sure with high probability? This is something that has to depend on the mean and the standard deviation that we wrote about. So let's think about it more carefully. Suppose that xi is the random variable that corresponds to the yield of tree i, and let S400 be the average yield of the 400 trees that we chose uh, to be treated. And suppose this average is 102. So it is a little bit higher than the 100 average that we saw before. So what are our assumptions? First, we assume that the trees are independent. They are identically distributed and independent. So we can just treat their sum as something that is more or less normally distributed because of central limit theorem. And the null uh, distribution, the distribution that says, well, nothing really is going to, this is, doesn't have any effect, is a distribution that is normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 0.5. So what we want is to reject the null hypothesis. We need to show that the probability that we get such a number, 102 or larger, is very, very small. So we do that by using the Z statistic. So as I said, the distribution of S400 is a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 0 0.5. We can normalize this uh, distribution to have mean 0 and standard deviation 1 by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Now we have the standard, the variable, random variable z, and its distribution is the standard normal. So if S400 is 102, we can easily see that it corresponds to z being 4. So what is the p-value? The p-value is the probability that z would be 4 or larger. And that is the same as the probability that the standard normal is larger than 4. And we also denote that simply by q4. So here we have it as a picture. You see that this is the normal distribution. And the 
and the distribution above four is is just around um, here and the uh, green arrow shows the region uh, from there to infinity um, that um, we're interested in in bounding the probability or um, integrating the area under the curve and that would be Q4. So how large is this Q4? So Q4, um, here is a few things you might want to think about. It's basically the inverse of the um, of the cumulative distribution function. Q1 is 15, 2 is 2.5, 3 is 0 0.15 percent, and Q4 is 0 0.003 percent. So indeed the probability that we get an effect of this size at random if the fertilizer doesn't help is extremely extremely small. Now notice that there is an asymmetry. In some decisions uh, there is no a priori bias, right? So if we ask which person runs faster it can be Bill or Joe. Um, if uh, we ask which party will win the upcoming election. It can be the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, there is no bias that says, oh, the default is something. But in other situations, there is very strong bias to one side. So in court, when we talk about somebody uh, being um, on trial, that person is innocent until proven guilty. So the default is that they're innocent and only with enough evidence you can show that they are guilty. In science, if you have a theory, then this theory will hold until you show data that is inconsistent with, this, with the science. So by default, uh, we just stick with the current theory. In medicine, a new treatment is assumed ineffective until mm, uh, clinical trials prove that it is effective. Okay, so various uh, medicine are suggested, but not everything is going to be proved as effective. When there is a strong bias, one side carries the burden of the proof. So what is burden of the proof? In the legal sense, it is that you need to produce enough evidence to move the conclusion away from the default position to one's own position. And an example is innocent until proven guilty. In statistics, the imperative is on the scientist arguing for a new theory to provide sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, which is the prevailing theory, and establish the new theory, the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis basically represents the opinion that nothing is new under the sun. You haven't shown us anything to convince us that our a priori beliefs should be changed. So an example of that would be to prove that police is guilty of racial profiling. So by default, we assume that, that the police is not guilty of racial profiling. And you need significant amount of evidence in order to prove that there is racial profiling. So I'll let you read this uh, little cartoon about um, understanding what, what proof means and in, that not everything that is published is, uh, is, uh, means that it is proven. Um, for a fact, um, you, you might be interested to know that most articles that are published in medical journals use a, use a confidence level of 5% which means that at least 1 over 20 of the published papers are unsubstantiated or wrong. So be a skeptic. When, even when you hear about some, something new that has been shown in, in scientific, uh, in scientific studies, um, you should be skeptical and ask for the evidence and for the p-value. Okay, so ask how much really evidence is there that this thing is true? Okay, so the hypothesis testing protocol goes something like this. 
you define a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis has to represent what people believe right now. And then you find a statistical test that is applicable to this uh, problem. And then the statistical test defines several things. It defines something called statistic, which is a function that maps a sample to a number or a random variable, but with a particular uh, functional form. And then a formula for the distribution of the statistic under the null hypothesis. So you're saying, OK, if the null hypothesis is correct, I expect to see this distribution of the um, random variable of the statistic. So then you define an acceptable confidence level, alpha. So this is usually something that is defined by the community or by the journals that are to accept your paper. Uh, common value is 5%, but then there is 1% or 0.1%. It all depends on what level of confidence does the, does the publication require in order to believe your results. Then you have to choose the size of the sample, sufficiently large, and then you run the experiment. You calculate the statistic and the p-value, and then you check, is the p-value smaller than this a priori decided value alpha? Um, if it is, then the null hypothesis is rejected and the alternative is established. So you've proven your point. Otherwise, the test failed, and you can't draw any conclusions. You can't, for instance, draw the conclusion that the null is correct, because you assume that the null is correct a priori, so you have really shown nothing. is always a compromise between making two types of errors. So in the example of the fertilizer, we have the uh, null hypothesis that the fertilizer is ineffective, and we have the um, alternative hypothesis that the fertilizer is effective. Okay, so um, if we have um, alpha be very small value, then we will fail to reject the null hypothesis, and therefore it might be a good fertilizer, but we still didn't accept it. On the other hand, if we set alpha to be too high, then we will reject the null too easily, even if the, um, if the null is true, and then accept the fertilizer even if its effect is relatively small. A few examples of statistical test. One of the simplest and most used is the t-test. We're going to look at two types of t-test. One is the one-sample t-test. Um, in this t-test, we assume that the null um, distribution is a normal distribution with mean zero, but we don't assume that we know its uh, variance or its standard deviation. The alternative is that the mean is not zero. Okay, So we're trying to show uh, that the mean is not zero, similar to what we did with the z-test, but the difference here is that we do not assume that we um, a priori know what is the um, variance. Okay, so then um, this test, um, when you call it uh, in Python in the standard way, um, it will tell you uh, whether the test has passed uh, the five percent significant test, okay? or it can return for you the p-value. The next test is the two-sample t-test, and um, here the null hypothesis is that um, x and y um, um, have are two samples, and the what we're trying to see is whether the means of these samples are um, the same or different, and um, and what we are um, assuming is that they are both drawn from a normal distribution, and um, that they both have the same uh, variance. In fact, there are two two types of this: pooled variance or different variances. Uh, whether x and y have same variance or different variances. So this is another test, and here. Um, the assumption is that we have two samples, not necessarily the same size. 
The Lily Force test is a test that we can perform to check whether indeed our distribution is normal. So as we saw before, the, the, te the t-test assumes that the distribution is normal. Um, and um, the Lily Force would test it and it would reject the null hypothesis um, if the distribution is different from uh, from the from normal distribution. The problem, of course, is that for the Lily Ford test to give you a significant result, um, you need a much larger sample than what you need for the t-test. So the t-test makes the assumption, the, the default assumption, that distribution is normal. Um, but and the Lily Ford would test for that assumption, but you'd need many more examples in order to uh, test for that. So uh, that ends our review of uh, hypothesis testing. And um, next we will talk about applying this to um, clinical studies.